Hey, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In this program, I have got Ken Fish with us, and we are talking about Masons. It's going to be another conversation about Freemasonry and specifically discussing deliverance. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Guys, we have a fantastic program for you today planned out. We're going to be discussing a lot of the origins of Freemasonry. We're going to be discussing uh, the different kinds of demonic spirits that seem to be afflicting people who have practiced or or been within the family unit of people that have practiced Freemasonry. It's going to be an exciting program. Lots of really great stuff. Love having Ken on the program with us. He is back once again. If you haven't seen some of the episodes we've done, we did an episode recently about walking in the power of the Spirit. We've done another video that is just wildly picking up steam, which is uh, our first installment to the subject on Freemasonry. Ken, that video has almost half, no, it has over half a million views on it, so extremely popular. I think what's going on is there's a lot of people who have experienced some weirdness around the Freemasonry subject, uh, didn't know that, man, there's a lot of bondage that's kind of wrapped up in this. My family's been doing this, and look, I've been afflicted by all this, and I think it was just put out at the right time where people were hungry for that information, and we're coming out with a part two to kind of answer some more of the questions that were out there on that uh, program. But for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, we cover content like this all the time, gifts of the spirit, uh, deliverance, that kind of content. If you want to be notified when we come out with more content, the best way to do that is to subscribe to the newsletter. You can find that in the description of this video. You get notified when we you know, release content for conferences, when we come out with uh, our courses that release, uh, that would be the best way to stay in contact. And you get a weekly email letting people know all the different things that are taking place here at Remnant. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you. Uh, like I said, this is Ken, uh, and that's Michael. Before I introduce Ken, Michael, uh, man, you, what are you looking forward to about the Mason stuff? Are you trying to break off some generational curses? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah? funny. I can see my little straws poking up. My wife literally just walked in and made me a smoothie. Um, <laughs> I, I'm glad that she gave you the most masculine cup you own. Smoothie. What's that? I'm glad that she gave you the most masculine cup you own for the, for the podcast. <laughs> I, it's got a straw <laughs> it's, I mean, but you can't judge a man's masculinity by the color of the smoothie. Like, guys, one of my favorite, one you of know, my favorite. It's not a sippy cup. That's oh yeah right it would have been very bad there was a recent right. recent post of uh, matt chandler with an ugly t-shirt an ugly sweater from christmas and it was pink and some reformed group posted like the feminization of pastors in america because it was pink bro i just uh, laughed his st- it's ugly it's an ugly sweater th- like i it's lost on people yeah. i thought it was great uh, but man, I'm excited to have Ken on the show. Uh, Ken is a friend, and so always like to to chat with him. And so, uh, and also to do an update and follow up to our last episode. So, what you guys can look forward to uh, in this one, we'll real quickly kind of redefine who are the Freemasons and um, and why are they so secretive? Like, or why why do they ha- why are they so hard to nail down? We'll we'll ask a few of these kind of introductory TM up questions, but then we're gonna look into some uh some additional topics as well such as the sexual abuse that occurs inside what kinds of spirits we need to specifically address and what takes place at some of the highest levels and connections to islam etc so uh it's going to be a great episode ken it's great to have you on the show uh i know you lead orbis ministries maybe tell us a little bit about that and then dive into that first question about who are the freemasons all right. Well, I'm Ken Fish. I founded Orbis Ministries in uh, 2010. So uh, if you count that that year, uh, this is our 15th year of, of being Orbis Ministries. Um, we do a lot of things there, but, you know, preach and teach. Uh, I have a podcast of my own. Uh, we have a training school. We have an online prayer room for people who don't know where to go to get ministry and we have more than that, but but that's enough to get you started. Our website is orbisministries.org, and it's O-R-B-I-S, orbisministries.org. So let's see, you asked me the question about Freemasonry. Um, the origins of the Freemasons are, well, they're ancient for sure. 
and it's just not entirely clear how far back they go. We know with, with no doubt at all, they go at least to the building of the great uh, Gothic cathedrals in Europe, which would put their, uh, their origins at least round about the, the uh, beginning of the 11th century or the, the 10, 10 years to 1000s, uh, somewhere in there. But, but some scholars think that the Freemasons go all the way back to the building of the great pyramids of Egypt. And if that is the case, then we may be looking at something that's 5,000 plus years old. Um, but it is a, a secret order. And so information is not uh, particularly easy to find. They don't uh, file you know, public disclosure documents every quarter, like a corporation that has publicly traded shares. Uh, it's, it's viewed as a fraternal organization, although to be clear, fraternal here is in the broadest sense and it includes women. There are branches of Freemasonry for the women as well as for the men. And as the name suggests, um, the earliest participants appear to have been primarily uh, people in the guilds, the tradesmen's guilds, and especially stone cutting uh, for purposes of building, whether it's cathedrals or pyramids. Uh, that's really where it all originates. And they're called the Freemasons because they didn't want to be subject to the rigid controls of the government. Um, for those who think that they came about during the time of the building of the cathedrals of Europe, uh, they were looking to be free of the uh, oversight and control of the Catholic Church. Now, of course, if you're a Catholic and you're building cathedrals, uh, you might want to have some oversight over what your stonemasons are doing. So was all of this bad? Well, as you know, this sort of thing turns into he said, she said, and it's a secret society. But what we do know is that at least officially, and I say it that way because uh, there's plenty of evidence that from time to time Masons are involved in the Catholic Church. At least officially, you are not allowed to be a Roman Catholic if you are a Freemason, period. The two are mutually exclusive. Um, and if you go you know, further back into the building of the pyramids, well, then we'd be talking about something that isn't specifically relevant to uh, rising up against Christianity, but rather any form of centralized power. So that's probably a good, whatever, two minute synopsis. So yeah, let, let's let's hang out on that concept of like the Egyptian mythology kind of being interwoven within uh, Freemasonry. From what I understand, and you can correct or just kind of give your perspective on this, uh, Freemasonry, uh, though this is the time that it emerges with these great cathedrals and these kinds of things, it's pulling its philosophies. That's why it makes it hard to date is because it's pulling its philosophies from or older uh, and later origins, kind of incorporating and syncretizing it in to their pagan practices. So, so first of all, maybe maybe help us with clarifying why it's kind of hard to date because of those things. And then secondly, maybe help us uh, understand how this is a syncretistic thing. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, that G on that that logo stands for God. You know, uh, my my great grandpappy, he was a Freemason, and you know, he he went to church, he went to me good Methodist believer. And, you know, he was a card carrying member of his local church. So, so can maybe you weigh into uh, one, this is a syncretistic practice and some of its origins within Egyptian mythology. Yeah. So the Freemasons are highly syncretistic. And the fact that they have a G there representing God, uh, to me, is neither here nor there. Um, by that, I don't mean that it makes the Freemasons uh, good, but rather it's not it's not conclusive proof that that they are something other than syncretistic because the word god as it is commonly used particularly among american christians the word god is used to denote um, a particular entity jesus taught us to call him father but but that's what we as christians mean when we say god but when we move outside of the christian domain um, God could be anything. Allah is a God. Uh, Vishnu, Shiva, Krishna, they are gods. And so when we talk about God in that sense, we're really talking about something like the um, ancient word ale, uh, E-L. Ale just meant any old generic God at all. And if you wanted to know which God did you mean, well, you could have, for example, El Shaddai, the all-powerful one. And so this is the all-powerful God if he's El Shaddai. Uh, but if you tag another word onto the end of El, then he becomes that God. So God, God is a word that's actually quite 
uh, indistinct. And so the fact that the Freemasons have put G um, as part of their logo is, is actually quite disingenuous. It means that they are not pinning themselves down to any specific God, and they'll include virtually anything that, that fits what they want to do. Um, and in that sense, we can think of well different religions of the world that allow many different gods to be worshipped. The, the Hindus are notoriously syncretistic. You go to India, you start evangelizing Indians, you tell them we worship Jesus, they say, so do we. Well, wait a minute, but you're Hindus and you worship Vishnu and Shiva and Brahma. Right, but 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 we we worship Jesus too because we include everybody. And the Buddhists are much the same. So that G is an inclusive G. It is not specifically the Christian God whose letters in Hebrew are YHWH. That, that is not what we're talking about at all. And it's quite confusing to people because the language is not distinct. Yeah, and the book that you recommended last time you were on the program was 33 Degrees of Deception, um, which was kind of, sounds like it was almost co-written uh, by a former 33, 33rd degree Freemason and then a partner of his who kind of collected his stories and told them. Uh, it's really, really interesting book. And that was one of the things that they mentioned was in a lot of these ceremonies that were being practiced to kind of level up into the different um, uh, movements of the Freemason you know, project, I don't know what we call it, religion. As they're moving up within this religion, they have three books that are uh, placed on the altar in all of of these ceremonies or in many of these ceremonies, which is the Bible, the Quran, and I guess some Hindu holy scripture that I was not super familiar with. Uh, but they, they would place these all out again, kind of displaying that there is no, there's no rhyme or reason to what God specifically they're speaking to. In fact, in some of the prayers, you're actually told to renounce the fact that Jesus is uh, pre-incarnate, that he he's a great teacher, sure, but he is not like this eternal, long-existent God. And you actually get frowned upon, mocked, and even pushed out of certain sects of Freemasonry if you pray in Jesus' name. Uh, they find it quite offensive. I, I thought it was very, very interesting, really interesting book. I'd recommend people uh, go pick that up if they're interested in studying more. 33 Degrees of Deception. Uh, Michael, sorry, I, I kind of stole the floor from you. Uh -oh. All good. Well, if we're going to talk about <clears throat> gods, talk to us about uh, Osiris and Hiram and the role of Egyptian myth mythology. How that? How did that play into the formation uh, of spirituality within the Masons? Well, again, if you if you take the point of view, and, and this isn't this isn't settled, but if you if you take the understanding that the Freemasons go all the way back to the building of the pyramids, then part of their tradition, part of their, part of their rites and rituals, part of their language set uh, would be drawn upon the various gods of Egypt. We know a lot more about uh, Egyptian gods today than they did even a hundred years ago because of the, you know, the findings of archeology span and the ongoing linguistic studies and so forth. Um, so what they're doing is they're drawing on um, some of the uh, key gods uh, that were worshipped within Egypt. And of course, we see some conflict there between uh, the Christian God, the Jewish God, um, and these Egyptian gods in the story of Moses. And one of the things you'll find is that with the Freemasons, they will often take these names that are, I mean, they were, they were names that were in use at the time that the story in the pages of scripture occurred. Uh, but they've now turned them, as it were, into code words or uh, gateways. And this is very similar, but not quite the same as what you see going on in witchcraft with the casting of spells. Uh, because when you cast spells, the whole point of it is to control, manipulate, channel, dominate um, spirits to get them to do your bidding, whatever that bidding may be. And the main way you do that is through these, these passwords, these code words. Uh, the Freemasons have something quite similar to that going on. And so they draw on these names of Egyptian gods. And remember this, this is very important to understand. Um, in the word of God itself, and meaning in the Bible, it explicitly states that the gods of the nations are demons. Many people don't know that. Paul makes reference to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, but, he, but he is alluding to, to something that's found in uh, the 106th Psalm, verses 36 and 37, which explicitly state all the gods of the nations are demons. So whether we're talking about Osiris, uh, whether we're talking about Marduk, 
whether we're talking about Baal, all of these are demons. And so what the Freemasons are doing, whether or not anyone tells you this, by, by calling upon, by summoning gods, uh, again, with a plural on it, any gods other than this one God whose four letters are YHWH, um, out of respect for our Jewish brothers and sisters, I, I don't say that name hardly ever. They don't say it at all. They, they simply defer when they see those four letters to Hashem, which is Hebrew for the name. But note that it's the name, not a name, not any old name. It's the name of the one God. That's what Hashem is really denoting when they say that. So any of these other gods that um, the Freemasons or anyone else might be calling upon, whether they know it or not, whether they divulge it or not, they are actually summoning, calling upon demonic power in order to affect whatever it is that they're trying to do, whether in their prayers, their spells, their rituals, whatever it may be. And some of this stuff can be real vile. I mean, um, I want to I want to go through some of the oaths and some of the initiation practices that they're kind of walking these people through. Um, you know, in 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 the book that you recommended, you know, the first first rung of initiations, you're pulled like you've got a you've got a hood over your head. You're pulled by a rope over your neck, kind of drug through. You're kind of beaten and assaulted. And and what's happening is you're you're reenacting a false god that's in Egypt, and they're they've renamed this false god in Egypt, and you're reenacting a play of a god that was you know, covered and beheaded and beaten. Uh, and then they literally bury your body and they raise you in this burial ceremony. It's horrific. Like, and it's not like, we're not saying that this person is like, you know, I solemnly swear to uphold the Freemasons. Like, it's not like you're saying this like cliche little, you know, empty prayer. Like you're actually reenacting a burial of a false God. At, you are the God in this enactment. It's a, it's a crazy process but but ken there's a, a lot of really odd things you, one of the things you mentioned was just kind of like the sexual abuse and misconduct that takes place could you maybe unpack some of that for us yeah it really shouldn't surprise anyone in the wake of you know jeffrey epstein and others but, certainly but, um there is a lot of sexual misconduct in the world and one of the places that it often occurs i i think it, to be fair um we can't say it always occurs, but it very frequently does occur that in Masonic lodges, um, in an upstairs room somewhere, uh, they will bring in people and sexually abuse them. And sometimes those people are children. So it, it would fall into the category of pedophilia. Um, and they will lay them on altars in a ritualistic way. Um, they strip them naked. They may drizzle blood over their bodies. They may perform sexual acts serially meaning more than one person is engaged in this with the victim. Um, and I've ministered to many people who have uh, been abused in Masonic ceremonies, um, oftentimes by their own fathers, mothers, uh, grandfathers, grandmothers, who were themselves Freemasons and who volunteered to bring their, in this case, children and grandchildren into the lodge to be part of that ritual and that ceremony. Now, to be clear, um, I've not heard very many stories of this happening at the lower levels of the Freemasons. And of course, there are 33 degrees there. Um, you are a fully initiated Freemason once you've gone through what they call the Blue Lodge Rites, which are levels one, two, and three. And uh, the rites associated with what you were just describing, Josh, um, are, are one of those at the base level of uh, one, two, three. Um, there's also one where they take a, a, a bare dagger blade. Um, they open your shirt. They lay that blade on your chest right over your heart. And part of the oath is that if you violate the oath of the uh, Freemasons or their vows of secrecy, um, then may a dagger be plunged into my heart and uh, may, I, may I find death. Um, you mentioned the, the burial one and, the, and the, what they call the hoodwink where they put the hood over your head and then they put a noose over your head. Um, they don't obviously actually hang you, but the threat is if you should violate the oaths and secrecy of the Freemasons, they, may I be strung up and hung by my neck until I am dead, in addition to having my heart cut out and these other things. So um, all of that is part of the rituals, but that's levels one, two, and three. And so when we talk about this kind of sexual abuse that goes on at the higher levels, there's a major break at, uh, at degree number 18 and so the sexual abuse part doesn't usually come in 
until beyond 18. Now, that's not to say it will always start at 19. Um, if you're a 19th or 20th degree Freemason, you might not have anything go on. 21 is another important break point in their progression. But what I, what I very commonly hear is that when Freemasons are at the 30th degree and higher, um, there it is, well, again, we don't want to say universal, but very, very, very common that those Freemasons at that level of seniority are involved in abusing people sexually, and whether it's rape, pedophilia, or whatever, it, it's not rare. Now, yeah. Ken, it's, it's, it would be right in saying that, and I, I, I want you to push back on this, but it's right in saying that Freemasonry can be in different regions and in different locations be practiced differently, where there are so, very similar practices, but like some of these sexual practices aren't necessarily required, are they, in certain degrees? But the idea that, uh, think of a fraternity, like this corporate hazing that's taking place and like having dirt on people is an important thing. Having someone's head covered, not knowing who is doing these things to you, but witnesses being there. Like this is this is a social, uh, it's a social construct that keeps people in line, keeps people obedient, keeps people hey, we know what happened to you sort of thing. So it's to say that there are various forms of this that could happen. Is it, is, am I hearing you right in saying this always happened after the 18th degree or that it could happen, but is not guaranteed to happen? I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, it, it could happen. It's not guaranteed to happen. Um, and if it's going to happen, the higher up you go, the more likely it is that you will be, uh, you will be involved because, you know, when the, when the Masons convene and they're in, you know, one of their gatherings, these are secret meetings, as we've said, um, but they may say, okay, Brother Mason, now this is what we require of you at this level. And so drink this blood or uh, here, um, take advantage of this victim who's staked out upon the altar here in the Masonic Hall. And, you know, it, they, they are, uh, the, the individual who's performing that action is observed. And now, if you want to say it this way, it becomes almost a form of blackmail except that they're never really supposed to divulge what was done. I think potentially it could be divulged and then that person might be prosecuted. But I don't think that's really part of the, the idea. I think what's really going on and they, you know, people at the higher levels, they know that they're dealing with spiritual power. And so what they're really doing is they are inducting someone to the next higher level and they are uh, bringing into them spiritual powers, demons, by the invoking of the names of these gods, by the actions they are undertaking. Um, and with that, the Masonic uh, hierarchy, the overlords, they have the ability to uh, control. They have the ability, based on the demonic activity that's there, to um, compel people to do whatever it is that you know the, the lodge master uh, required of them. Hmm. Uh, Ken, it's really helpful, one, when you talk about levels, because I've talked to so many people, they're like, I'm in the Masons, and we don't do all that stuff. And of course, you know, one response is, well, it, it's secretive, are they are they telling the truth? But I mean, I've, I've met honest people who, who tell me that. And I think what I hear you saying is, a lot of this kind of stuff happens at the higher level. So I think that's helpful. And then the other uh, the other thing I think is helpful is as you were as you were talking about the sexual abuse, you talked about it in a ritualistic context. Context. It wasn't like some black sheep snuck into the higher level of the Masons and secretly did this thing. It was like this was part of their religious ritual, that's and right. so I think that's a helpful differentiator between uh, Masons and when sexual abuse tragically happens elsewhere, they've actually built this into their ritual at higher levels is what I hear you saying. Yeah. And I want right. to ask, and let me just and add wanna... something to that. Real okay, quick. Sure. I want to hear your question, but since we're here, I just want to uh, throw this in, you know, there are many religious systems in the world where, um, sexual abuse or what we would call abuse anyway, ritualized sex, is part of the religious system. And one of the most obvious uh, that we could point to is many of the, um, many of the religious practices of Mesoamerica, meaning you know, Mexico, Central America, uh, running through the Aztecs, running through the Mayans, running through the Inca, many of their practices involved not only human sacrifice and the literal eating of flesh and drinking of blood, um, but in fact, 
there was ritualized sexual activity that went on. If, if you go back and most people have never done this and, you know, we've all been trained by our school systems, I guess now to view Cortez and uh, the Spanish conquerors as nothing other than imperialists. Uh, they may have been some imperialism going on there. I'm not trying to undercut that entire narrative, but, but I think something that is often omitted is if you look in the journals of Hernan Cortez, who was the leader of the first wave of the conquistadores, Cortez records in his journal that when they rode into what is today Mexico City, Teotihuacan in the ancient language, as they rode in, they rode in under an archway of 185,000 human skulls. Now, where did they get that number? Well, they later took it apart and counted them all. And where did all those human skulls come from? Human sacrifice. And as they rode into Teotihuacan, and by the way, this pyramid is still right in the heart of Mexico City. It's, it's the, the ground level is higher, but you can see the very top of it. Cortez records in his journal that as they rode in, the high priest plunged his knife into the chest of a victim who was staked out on the altar at the top of the pyramid. He cut the victim open and re uh, withdrew the beating heart, still beating heart, and bit into it and ate the flesh and drank the blood that was in the chambers of the heart. And Cortez records that that priest, his hair was matted with blood and feces from all of the sodomistic rituals they had been doing to the victims before they sacrificed them. So I'm not saying that the Freemasons do all of that. I mean, they might, but, but what I'm saying is ritualistic sex is known in the annals of the world. And there are other parts of the world where it still goes on, um, but that one is just so blatant and blunt. And it shows you the depth to which human beings can go in their pursuit of whether power or pleasure or whatever. Okay. I mean, cult prostitution is super popular throughout even the Bible, right? Like we, they talk about, the Bible talks about cult prostitution. Um, Asherah and Baal worship is basically just a massive orgy that takes place on high hills uh, where right. we're trying to attract these deities, the, the, the fertility goddesses and the storm goddesses to come together and give a prosperous season. I mean, the, it's all, it's, it's most of religious history has had sex incorporated with the practice of those religions so well, and, that is hinduism, that's not there's an entire there's an entire strain of hinduism that engages in something called tantra and that's all ritualized sex mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's interesting here one branch of the freemasons um, not one that people know very well it's it's kind of a more shadowy minority branch of it but it's known as rosicrucianism um, the rosicrucians draw very heavily on uh, Hindu ritual and Hindu religion in what they do. So maybe the uh, Scottish Rite Freemasons are drawing on Christianity because Scotland was at least at one time supposedly Christian. Um, and so the Scottish Rite Freemasons may draw on the Christian faith. Whereas when we look at uh, the Shriners, they're drawing on Islamic faith. And when we move over to the Rosicrucians, they actually have a full fledged teaching on reincarnation and they draw on the Hindu gods, and right in the middle of all of the Rosicrucianism is in fact this teaching on tantric sex. So ritualized sex is part of many religious systems in the world, and we're here to talk about Freemasons, but I would just say a lot of what goes on in modern Wiccanism has its own versions of ritualized sex as well. Hmm. Okay, well, I had a question a long time ago, but uh, I actually am gonna <laughs> change my question. Uh, I was going to ask about oaths. We'll get to oaths uh, and ritual oaths, but I think we've, we've kind of gone down a different trail. So I want to ask you this, because we've been talking about sexual abuse and ritual sex. And so specifically, you had told, uh, you had told us that, uh, I mean, just a little bit earlier in the interview, that you have, I, I think, addressed spirits or you, you've encountered this in ministry where someone was sexual abuse. So it, it wasn't just like, hey, I, I read about this book or I read about this in a book or something like that, which has its own validity uh, for sure. But this was like, no, you you have cast spirits out of somebody that was ritually sexually abused in uh, the Masons, if I heard you right. So uh, could you tell us maybe one of those stories and kind of put 
um, just kind of illustrate that for us. Um, you're casting spirits out or addressing ritualistic, like how are you even ministering in that scenario? Th this would be a fair moment for all the soccer moms who have their kids in the car when we're listening to Remnant Radio to maybe hit the pause button. We probably should have given that disclaimer out a, a few moments earlier. And then also I'll take this moment to remind Kim, uh, Ken that we are on YouTube. So, um, <laughs> so uh, maybe, so maybe <laughs> package it with well, appropriate language. I, I'm sure you yeah, can do I'm that. Not, you're, you're, you're a skilled clear, orator. To be clear, I'm not asking to give me details about the acts that were done. I'm asking about your ministry time and how you approach that. There you go. Okay. Praise God. So the way, the way this might come up as an example is, um, someone approaches us and says, Hey, I, you know, I want prayer. And they, as they're describing whatever their particular issues are, you're listening to the pattern and you're saying, well, this pattern often occurs in Freemasonry. Um, if it's a different pattern, and we might not even ask about the Freemasons, we might be looking at something different. But this pattern that we've just heard described is sounds like it could be Freemason. So tell me, ma'am, do you have Freemasonry in your family? Well, it's strange that you ask. Yes, um, my father was a Freemason, my uncle was a Freemason, and so was my grandmother. She belonged to something called the Order of the Eastern Star. And, uh, and my grandfather that was married to her um, he was a lodge master at the, you know, XYZ Lodge. Now in the West, in America, England, places like this, uh, the two most common branches are the Scottish Rite and the York Rite. There are others though. Um, so, all right, tell me about that. Well, you know, they, so they were, they were Freemasons. Now the thing with Freemasonry, and I think I mentioned this the last time I was on the show, is that when somebody joins the Freemasons, one of the oaths that they take is they pledge forever. And let me just pause at that for a moment, forever. They pledge in perpetuity forever, all of their, the legal term is issue, all children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, et cetera, that will ever come out of their loins forever and ever, amen, no exceptions, no break, that's the way it goes. That they will become Freemasons, that they will serve uh, Jabulon, who's the ruling spirit of Freemasonry, and that they will join the lodge and serve the lodge. And so for a lot of people, like in our story here, um, this woman, she doesn't know it, but she's been pledged to an evil spirit to serve Jabulon and the Freemasons. But here's her problem. She's not actually doing that. In fact, she might well be a Christian if she's showing up in one of my meetings. But you don't have to be a Christian. You could have gone in some other direction. Uh, you could have gone after... Um, I don't know, uh, secularism, or you could have gone after uh, maybe being a Buddhist. But the point is you're not following the lodge. You're not following Jabulon. That's the, that's the big marker. And so Jabulon thinks he has ownership of you because you were pledged. You were brought as a, as a gift. And so he wants to assert his authority over your life, your body, your brain, and so he begins to manifest things in your life which are destructive and harmful because you've broken the oath. And the whole purpose of it is to get you to come into line and submit. And so now here I am in a meeting, I'm dealing with this individual and they say, well, yeah, you know, so I had this you know, grandfather, this grandmother, my own father, my uncle, all of them were practicing Freemasons. And I'm like, okay, uh, we need to cast some demons out of you. And so we... You know, we start that process and as the demons are coming out, or maybe before we even get started, um, now this woman says, well, you know, I have this memory of when I was about six years old, my grandpa took me to the lodge and he brought me upstairs and we were in this darkened room and there were all of these men standing around in a circle and there was a big, I guess it was a table, or at least I thought it was a table. And they laid me down on the table without my clothes on. They, they stripped me or told me to take off my own clothes. And, uh, and they laid me on the table and there were candles lit all around. And they began uh, dripping blood on me. And then I was violated. It would be something like that. And so like, oh, okay. So now we need to deal with spirits of rape. We need to deal with spirits of you know, whatever it is that was done to you. Um, this is all part of the deliverance, getting those people out of this engagement with this, with the Masonic line, which they never agreed to be part of, but they were pledged, they were dedicated. And 
it's be careful now. I'm going to give you an analogy, but you know, many of us dedicate our children to the Lord Jesus in church when they're born because we want them to serve the Lord. I'm that one's okay, right? Because we're serving a good God, and Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Suffer the little children to come unto me, and do not forbid them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. Well, the Freemasons have their own dark version of that, and what they're really trying to do is to induct, and and as needed, through the force of trauma and violation, um, force people to come under the power of Jabulon and to become good, loyal subjects of the Lodge. That does go on. And I've had many of those conversations with massive deliverance, not just about Freemasonry as a generalized concept, but about the sexual abuse that was performed on an altar somewhere in a Masonic hall somewhere. And, and these these rituals, I mean, they sound they sound they sound archaic. They sound, I mean, like something out of a movie. Like it doesn't it you know for a person that comes into this and goes okay i think this is a generally christian space and you know it's like <laughs> it sounds it sounds like for most people when they think of freemasonry they think of like you know christian yoga right they're like oh you know this is just a person who's a real godly believer and they're accidentally playing with something they don't really know how bad it is but like you're describing this and it's like they drink blood from a what you know like you know like just the, the you start getting into this stuff and it's wild can you maybe talk to us about some of the some of the oaths some of of the vows and and some of the rites and rituals that they perform that would be inherently unchristian and and how these things are deeply demonic in their in their origin because again you're making vows over and over if i break this vow you know put like that my life be taken from me stabbed through the heart you know hung whatever like talk us through what this is actually doing and how this is opening ourselves up to some deeply demonic and problematic things yeah well i've said before that um Freemasonry, this is going to sound very strong, and I know that, but anyway, Freemasonry is actually Satan worship. And the reason it's Satan worship is because this ruling spirit, Jabulon, is a guise of Satan himself. He has many guises that he likes to uh, come in. Uh, in some places he's known, for example, as, say, Baphomet. But that's not really a Freemason's term. That's more out of the realm of traditional witchcraft. But, but within the Freemasons, what they're doing is they're engaging in rituals that are very much like what we find when we deal with people who have been subjected to satanic ritual abuse, or SRA. And that's because Freemasonry is Satan worship. And again, I know that's a very strong thing to say. Now, on its surface, it doesn't appear to be that way. It looks like a civic organization. But, you know, Jeffrey Epstein looked like he was just a talent recruiter in Hollywood, too. So, uh, as the scripture says, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And as one of my early mentors, when I was a you know, younger Christian, he used to say, uh, the devil always dresses himself in a Brooks Brothers suit. Well, Brooks Brothers is out of business now, so maybe we'd say an Armani suit, but it's the same idea. So usually the outward face looks very good, clean, noble upright and so the freemasons come across as though they are the pillars of morality in the community but what's really going on is all of these rituals all of these oaths all of these covenants are designed to bind you to demonic powers that are themselves under the rule of satan and with that to make you somebody who serves the powers of darkness and so whether it's an uh, some sort of a curse you bring down on your own head by saying, you know, if I should ever violate the oath of the Freemasons, may my out, may, may my eyes be gouged out, uh, may my tongue be cut out. Um, that's a pretty horrific thing. But what many people don't realize, and they tend to treat it as, well, kind of cavalier is, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, that sounds really gruesome. But, you know, that's just like something we say at Halloween. No, this is actually a real curse. And there are demonic enforcers that go with every curse that has any power. And so it might actually happen down the road that if you were to violate the, the, the secrecy vow, by the way, most Freemasons, even ex-Freemasons, even people who have left the lodge and asked to demit, meaning they've written to the lodge and say, take my name off the roll. Most of them are very reluctant to talk about the things that they have said, done, 
etc. while in the Freemasons. Because in the back of their mind, they're thinking, my God, that might actually happen to me. And, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how many lodges have, you know, enforcement divisions. But, but it's always in the back of the mind of any Freemason that this might be done to me. So it might be something like that where there's bodily injury. Uh, there may be something where, uh, I don't know, they, they, they turn you over to the authorities and you no longer have the protection of the Masons. One of the things that the Masons do is they protect their own. So, for example, when a Freemason is getting ready to die, the, the brother Masons will come, or maybe the sister Masons if it's a female branch. I've had more experience with the male side of it, but, but not zero with the women. <clears throat> um, the brother Masons will come to take the body and perform a Masonic uh, funeral. And I, I have a friend who is a, uh, an Anglican priest, and he told me a story of one time he had a man in the parish who uh, they didn't know he was a Freemason, but he was dying. And um, four Freemasons came to the home where he was dying in the full Masonic regalia to take him away. And my friend, he stood between them and the man who was dying. And he said, I will not let you in here. You are Freemasons. And whatever you are going to do, it's, it's satanic. And you cannot have the body of this man. He's one of my congregants. And this is one of the things you brought up a few minutes ago, Josh. We didn't really revisit it. But it's, it's very common in a lot of the mainstream denominations to find people who aren't particularly devout. They may not even truly be converted. But they are, um, but they are in the church somehow, and they go through the motions. And quite, quite often, you find them they're on the boards of these churches and things like that. It's the Freemasons like to do that, so they can control what's going on in the house of God. Um, I found very high incidents of Freemasonry um, among Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians. Um, it's less common among maybe the Anabaptist type branches, so the Baptists, uh, Nazarenes, people like that. But it's not zero. Um, you find Freemasons among the Unitarians and, again, other sort of what we used to call the WASPy denominations, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant type denominations. Um, they, they are they're surprisingly common. And if you go into parts of, say, rural England or rural Australia, you might go into a parish church where perhaps every single man in the church is a Freemason. The Catholic Church officially forbids Catholics from being Freemasons, but I know from experience that there are some Catholics and some of them join these Catholic guilds um, that are available for lay people. And, and actually some of those guilds actually begin functioning, I don't know what to say, as some sort of a front organization for the Freemasons and they themselves become a recruiting funnel uh, for bringing people out of straight line Catholicism uh, through these, these guilds. And ultimately they, they get them to join the Freemasons. That sort of thing does go on. Um, it depends on the region, how common it is, uh, but it occurs both within Catholicism and Protestantism. And it occurs in the Orthodox churches as well, although I don't have as much experience with them there uh, I know that it goes on there as well. And as we've already mentioned, the Freemasons are active, at least in some sort of synergy with Islam, through the Shriners and through uh, with Hinduism, through the Rosicrucians. So you can see that, that they are always active trying to draw people out of even the conventional branches of religion. And I'm not thereby endorsing other religions. I'm just saying drawing people out of what we think of as conventional branches uh, and using these, these funnels as a way of drawing people in. And so you asked the question about the kinds of oaths and, and vows that they would take. Well, it would be if I ever, if I or my descendant should ever depart from serving Jabulon of, of you know, being a loyal lodge member, then may these penalties and decrees come down upon me. Uh, may I be chopped into a thousand pieces, buried alive, whatever it might be. Well, yeah, and we would we would say as Christians, vows of secrecy and silence and 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 vows that you will lie in perpetuity about things that, and withhold truth like we're called to live in the light um this is not a christian practice like um also don't sign an nda but not saying it's the same thing just saying don't do it uh michael Rancher. <laughs> amen to that. Well, you know, let me say something about that too so when we think about oaths what did jesus say about oaths um don't, don't do take, it don't take, right don't make them so 
Oh, so you're thinking about it in terms of NDAs. Now that's interesting. No, well, not so much. I think there's a, I think there's a proper legal place in okay. commerce for there to be non-disclosure agreements so that proper due diligence can get done. But what we're talking about here isn't an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. It's rather that we, we force you to swear a vow of secrecy and silence. And if you ever violate it, it's not that we're going to take you to court to seek monetary damages. We're going to take your life. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so let, let me ask you this. Um, if somebody enters in at the lower levels and they're not making these kind of oaths over their children, they're not saying, I worship Jabulon and drinking blood and doing all this crazy stuff. If they just join, do they endanger themselves of receiving an evil spirit? Number one yes. and number, okay. And then number two, which ones? So in our last, our part one, you emphasize death and infirmity as two of the spirits. But but are there some others? Because there are all kinds of, you know, other other gods uh, that they're worshiping. And, you know, Jabulon, I remember you saying that uh, Ja or Yah uh, is rooted in Yahweh, the Hebrew God. Um, and uh, I mean, the God we worship, uh, Yahweh. Uh, and then the middle initial buzz, a variation of Baal or Baal. And then I can't remember the last one was like some Egyptian God or something like that. So, right. So they're, they're worshiping all the other gods. Like what kind of spirits are they subjecting themselves to? Well, when they, when it, it will depend on the oaths they're asked to take, uh, there's fairly standardized oaths for the first three degrees, but, um, but again, remember there are different lodges and different uh, branches within Freemasonry. So, what they might be doing in the Scottish Rite might not be the same as what they do in the York Rite, which might not be the same as what they do in the Shriners. Uh, but in the first three degrees, you are uh, you are becoming inducted and you become a full-fledged mason at the end of those three degrees. Um, one of the gods you will be dealing with is Jabulon. Now, Jabulon, as I said on the last show, is an unholy trinity. There are three gods in there, and you just named them. We have um, Hashem, is what I would prefer to say. Uh, we have uh, Baal, the ancient fertility god of the Canaanites, and we have Anurus, the Egyptian god of war. And so, again, we're pointing back towards Egypt, um, but, but what we're saying is this unholy trinity, somebody might object and say, well, but you see that one god that's the Hebrew god, he's in there, so it's okay, right? No, because the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods alongside of me, not just, in, not just that precede me. And so by dealing with Jabulon, uh, we're dealing with this Hebrew God with two other gods right alongside of it. And one of the things that happens in the, in the Old Covenant is that if you are worshiping another God, this is actually a capital offense. Now, we're not going to put people to death in the modern period. I think that's you know, one of the advantages that uh, Christian enlightenment has brought to the world that we don't just make everything a capital offense. But when you think about the seriousness of what this is, leading people astray to worship the gods, um, especially in a time in history, in that old covenant period, where there's no blood of Jesus by which we can effect deliverance uh, from evil spirits, uh, it, we actually want to stamp this out right away. And so it's in the Mosaic Code that this is what they're going to do. Now, in the New Covenant, we don't stamp people out. We don't put them to death, or at least we shouldn't. I mean, I'm aware of what the Catholics did in the Inquisition. But um, but here's the thing, and people don't realize this. I learned this after many years of deliverance ministry. Um, so this is a key learning, is that if you do something that under the Old Covenant would have been punishable by death, in the New Covenant, you may live physically, but you will likely attract a spirit of death onto yourself. And in so doing, how does the spirit of death most commonly operate? Through sickness. And so you may find that your life is foreshortened. And that will be because of some lingering, wasting disease that has come upon you. So let's pick something that we might not commonly think about. It might put the fear of God in some people, which might not be bad. Um, divorce and uh, as a result of adultery. 
So in the old covenant, if somebody committed adultery, this was a capital offense. And it's a strange thing, but many people who get involved in, they get married, but now they become adulterous. It's strange how often those people end up with odd diseases, frequently of the liver, but there are other organ systems that can be affected. And no one can figure out why this is. The doctors can't figure it out. They don't know what's wrong. And their health just sort of continues to decline. Well, in like manner, if someone has been involved in something where they've pledged themselves to another God, which is a capital offense in the old covenant, <coughs> they pledge themselves to, a, to another God besides Hashem. Uh, perhaps they've been involved in ritualistic worship involving dedicated food or drink or blood, um, all of which are forbidden in both the Old and the New Testament. Again, take a look at 1 Corinthians 10. It's a chapter in the New Testament that most preachers just jump right over because they think it doesn't apply anymore. After all, who's engaging in idolatry in America today? But when you, when you go down through all of that, you realize, my gosh, it is really strange how many people who have gotten involved in Hinduism and yoga, people who have gotten involved in the Freemasons, people who have gotten involved in adultery, all of these things would have carried a death penalty in the Old Covenant. How many of them have really uh, like weak constitutions? Their health isn't good. They're constantly getting sick. They are, they seem like they're in and out of the hospital getting treatment for this, that, and the next thing. And the next thing you know, you find out, well, old Joe, he died of a heart attack at age 54. And everyone's like, Gosh, that's so young. Why did he die at age 54? Well, nobody knows on the surface. But if you go back and look at old Joe's history, well, it turned out he joined the Freemasons when he was you know, 28 years old, looking to get ahead. And he later demitted and walked away from it at age 35. But he never got deliverance from the spirits that were in him because he'd become a Freemason. And so they worked their havoc and he died at age 54. God rest in peace, right? That's, that's the kind of scenario that we would commonly see. Ken, uh, I've got two questions, and, and I've, it's at, we're at 52 minutes. I, I'm okay with going a little bit over if, if everyone else is, but um, the they're very different questions. I really want to make sure we ask the question about um, cities. I think mine actually is one of them. Uh, that is established on that gridlock of the Freemason divine geometry. Like I hate the concept and everything I've ever heard about strategic spiritual warfare. Like I just don't like it. Like I just, I've got nothing good to say. I've done as much research as I can and I've come out empty. But like if the enemy actually wanted to develop our cities in such a way that was dedicated to some false entity, does that need to be broken in some way? Like I don't have any biblical reference on how to do that. So I'm not comfortable doing kind of esoteric Christian practices, trying to break off Freemason curses or anything, but like Washington DC is like laid out using this kind of divine geometry. So I'm curious, like one, is there something that we should do with that? And I, I should just let that question be there. Uh, I'm super curious, maybe for selfish reasons, but uh, I want to know. Uh, well, there's no doubt that the Freemasons have been involved in laying out cities. Um, Washington, D.C. is one of them. Interestingly enough, Canberra, Australia, which is the equivalent of Washington, D.C. for the nation of Australia, uh, it too is laid out on a Masonic grid. Um, but there are others. Uh, I was in uh, Santiago, Chile uh, a few years ago, and there was a Masonic grid that had been laid out as part of the construction of that city. You might say, what are the Freemasons doing in South America? Well, the Freemasons infiltrated Europe in the Middle Ages, again, regardless of whenever they got their start. And so most of the um, houses of royalty and nobility within Europe are shot through with Freemasonry. And so when the Spanish came to the New World and they were building cities, um, many of them were laid out using Freemasonry symbols, lines, etc., and it's interesting, um, particularly within uh, within Santiago. When I was down there, there are very specific what are known as lay lines, L A Y lay lines, um, that run from one point to the next. And really, the point of the of the Masonic layout. And and let me just pause for a moment before I finish the sentence and say the Masons aren't the only ones who do this. 
um, the Mexicans did this uh, with uh, the pyramids and so forth in Teotihuacan. Um, the Babylonians did it a lot. Uh, the Egyptians did it. So all of these things are designed to lay out ley lines, which are really, they're lines along which spiritual power flows. If you think of an electrical line, you'll be in about the right direction. But of course, we're talking spiritual power, not electrical power, but it is just as real. It's just different. And so um, these ley lines are there in order to lock in specific locations so that the entities that are over these cities can control them. And um, Josh, you made the comment you haven't been particularly impressed with the stuff you've read on this point. I'd encourage you to get a book called Prayer Altars by John Melinde, M-U-L-I-N-D-E, John Melinde. Um, he is an African apostle. Uh, I, would, I would consider him an apostle um, from Uganda. And um, he, he talks about these altars, which is, what is an altar? I, I think, again, sometimes Christians have their own language set of what this means. But an altar is an anchor point. That's what it is. And um, altars are places where spirits become attached. It's like, it's, we could say it's a portal, if you like that language better. But it's a place where those powers that are in the air, these spiritual powers in what some people call the second heaven, can come down and they attach to the earth and it, and it becomes their access way. And so what the, what the Masons have done with their layout of the cities is they've created various altars. Um, now, whether there's ever an animal or a human sacrificed on those altars is not the point, but they have created altars that are attachment points for uh, the Masonic powers to be able to exert their influence. Hmm. Okay. So, by the way, so, like, so what do I do? Like, so, so, that's, I mean, sure. Well, like, I, I, I don't think that they're sacrificing, you know, b bulls and goats because they don't have power. Like, I think they're doing something like that dude in the Bible sacrificed his kid on the wall because it did yeah. something like there, there are, yeah, there's power and, and sure. Okay. So I, I don't think that it was an accident that they built the pyramid the way that they did, or they built the, you know, city of Ada the way that it did, but <clears throat> what do I do? You know, like, am, am I supposed to do anything? Am I supposed to, like, my answer to all the spiritual strategic warfare has been do evangelism, preach the gospel. But okay, if you've got I like a, a Shriner Club across the street or you've got a Freemason Lodge and you know that your city's been built this way, should you have to, should you do anything? Yeah. Um, there are people who, who do this and they believe it's highly effective. I don't think that going around doing strategic warfare is just for everybody. I think there are some people and they have, I would say, unique ministries. They're commissioned by the Lord to do this. And they go around and they engage in this kind of strategic warfare. And in the aftermath of it, there are significant breakthroughs. If you guys want to interview a couple of people who do this on the show, we can talk afterward. I'll give you their names and tell you how to get in touch with them. And they can give you testimony after testimony after testimony of the effect that they've seen from it. But what they're really doing, um, to use John Melinde's language, is they're tearing down the altars that are the attachment points or the points of access uh, for these uh, spirits that, that claim particular regions and geographies. And we know that that's a biblical idea because we know about the Prince of Persia, for example, from the book of Daniel. Um, and there are similar kinds of passages we could point to. For example, I think Legion, who was in the man in the graveyard in Mark chapter five, I think that was a dominion level regional spirit over the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Gennesaret. Sea of Tiberias, all these are the same body of water. Uh, and it extended at least as widely as the 10 cities, the Decapolis. Uh, and interestingly, the man that was delivered, he lived in one of the 10 cities, the one called Gadara. So the Bible contemplates all of this and has this worldview, but many of us don't have this worldview. So when we read these things, they go right over our heads and we don't even realize what's right there in front of our eyes. And it's because of the secularized world worldview that we've inherited here in the West. But when you start becoming more, um, I don't know, I, I mean, I didn't go looking for this stuff. I just ran into it and I started learning how it really functioned. And I started seeing breakthrough, whether in deliverance or healing or whatever. Um, then I started to realize that, you know, maybe all this stuff that I never thought was a thing is actually a thing. 
Hmm. Okay. Well, we could go on a long bunny trail here on uh, the subject of spiritual mapping and strategic level spiritual warfare, uh, which, uh, but I will stick, however, I, so I'm going to get off that bunny trail, but I am going to stick with the practical theme. Sure. And that is practically, what do we do if we or a loved one has engaged with the Masons, or even if it's a dead loved one who was a forefather or foremother, um, foremother, there's a word, but uh, one of our ancestors, just what do we do in response? Can you, uh, and, and maybe I could ask it this way. Could you tell us what to do by telling a story? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I've had so many people come with pretty much the exact scenario you just described. So, you know, in the conversation, either they bring it up or in, as I'm dialoguing with them, it comes out uh, that they had a, say, a grandfather or great grandfather who was a Freemason. Um, and we have to get rid of the Freemasonry. Now, probably the single most dramatic story I have uh, in this regard, I've got a bunch of dramatic ones, but I think this one is t definitely takes the cake. I was in Dallas, Texas, and I was speaking in a church. And hey, uh, there was a man. Yes, sir. I'm actually going to interrupt you because you did tell that story on the last episode. Although, it's is is this the story where uh, with the digestive thing that was yeah, yeah. kind of eating them up on the inside? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Michael so, Rontree, I mean, how no dare you be like, oh, oh, no, no leftovers. We can't do twice baked just, uh, testimonies. Just, you get well, one and done, Ken, on Remnant Radio. If you don't share a new fine. story, it well, doesn't well, count. I, I will tell I'll you guys this story. though, like. If for no other reason but to hear that insane story, you need to go watch episode one. Just search. <laughs> <Mason's> <laughs> video. It's nuts. Um, but Ken, by the way, that kid, I know that you are like a in that story. He's still that? healed today. I heard from his father just before Christmas. Wow. Praise God. Yeah. But I, so, I know but that you are like a, you wanted a, a story. reservoir of stories. So I know you've got another one. I know yeah. you do. Yes. So this this next story comes from um, Australia, and it was it was interesting because I had I'd been ministering in an Anglican church, and a man had come up, and he had had uh, he his arm he didn't have any uh, most of his muscles had been removed surgically, and he didn't have um, ligaments and tendons so that he could use his arm normally. And that struck me as odd. And I began talking with him and it turned out that he'd had all of that removed because he developed a melanoma that wasn't just on the surface of the skin. It had gone into his body. And so the surgeons had removed all of that to spare his life. And so I said, well, that's interesting. Where, so tell me about your background. Turns out he was the grandson of a Freemason. So we prayed and we broke the uh, Freemasonry over him. And there's a very specific way that I go about doing it. Um, it's not a magic formula. It's just meant to be thorough. So when I finished praying for him, um, he seemed to be improved and he had some mobility in the arm that he didn't have, but he wasn't all the way fine. The next morning was Sunday. I preached the Sunday morning service. And the rector of the church said at the conclusion of the service, now many of you have been touched by the Lord you know, this weekend, and Ken's going to be over here on the side of the church for a receiving line. Um, if you'd like to come over and share with him briefly how the Lord has blessed you through his time here, uh, feel free to do that. And so here comes the guy with the arm uh, down, the, down the line to shake my hand. And when he gets to me, he goes, I just have one thing to say. And I said, What's that? And he puts up both of his hands like this and he says, praise the Lord. So wow. the, the healing had concluded overnight that had wow. started the previous afternoon. But let me say it again for emphasis. His muscles, his ligaments, his tendons had been surgically removed by doctors because of the melanoma. So, you know, he, that was a pretty dramatic healing. But I went on yeah. from there to Melbourne, Australia, that was that occurred in uh, Bateman's Bay, uh, which is in the southeast corner of the country. Um, so anyway, I go on to Melbourne, Australia, and I'm in a meeting and this woman approaches me and she says, I'd like prayer. Um, I've had melanoma and I'm thinking, huh, that's an interesting coincidence that I just had this situation with a man who'd had melanoma and he was out of Freemasonry. So I said to her, 
um, do you happen to have Freemasons in your family? She says, well, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. And I said, oh, well, wow. Um, how much melanoma have you had? She said, well, I've had over 100 melanomas removed from my body over time. Mm. I said, that's pretty crazy. And she goes, yeah, and look at this. And she's, you know, she's wearing glasses and she takes off her glasses. She had a false nose as part of her glasses. And there's a hole this big in the center of her face because they had to remove the nose and go in to get rid of all of that melanoma that had affected her there. And so I, I went after the Freemasonry there and drove a bunch of Masonic spirits out. And so, again, you can see this model that I described of death and infirmity. The infirmity in this case is melanoma, but it's designed to bring on death. And um, she was a descendant of a, of a Masonic father who had been a lodge master. And um, anyway, so she goes through this massive, massive deliverance. Her nose did not grow back in that moment. But she came to a meeting that I was leading a couple of years later and she walked up to me and she said, hi, do you remember me? And I said, uh, no, I'm afraid I don't, ma'am. And she said, well, I'm the one who had the, you know, the Groucho Marx glasses and nose and uh, and she wasn't wearing any glasses. And she goes, here, touch my nose. And, and I she she had me touch the nose of that glasses two years before. And it, it was a hard nose. It, it looked quite natural. It looked quite good on the face. It was a good prosthetic. But uh, but she had me touch her nose. And it was, you know, as you'd expect, a little bit flexible. had some cartilage in it. Um, and she said, I've had no recurrence of melanoma since she prayed for me. Wait, so that it, it was a partial prosthetic? Is that what you're saying? But it was no, largely I'm healed? No, the nose that was attached to the glasses uh, was a complete Oh, the original. Nose. But she complete. had regrown her nose in, in its entirety. Time. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's stunning. Okay. And so to get to the practical, you said you have a process and uh, I know we're a little over time, so kind of on the faster side. So somebody's going through this and so you're repenting, you're renouncing, you're commanding. Talk to us through what you do. Yep. And before I do that, let me just say I have a CD or a downloadable recording, whichever people can buy it for. I forget what we have it up for. Maybe it's $10 or something. Uh, that will walk you through this in far more detail than I can in the time we have. You can buy it in the Orbis Ministries store, uh, orbisministries.org, and just go to store and look for um, the, the, the particular teaching on getting free of Freemasonry. Uh, but, but the first thing we do is we have the person, whether they were themselves involved or they were the descendant of someone who was involved, um, confess the sin of putting another God in front of Hashem. And... I don't care if they use the term Hashem. I do, but but they can say God. But they better mean the God, not just some random God. So they violated the first commandment. And they're confessing, if it's their ancestors, they're confessing generationally. I take ownership of what my ancestors did wrong. I want to set this right. And so I confess the sin of, of idolatry and of worshiping other gods. All right. Um, with that, I renounce uh, Freemasonry itself. I declare that I will not serve the lodge. I will not be a member of the lodge. Um, so I declare I will not serve the lodge and I will not serve Jabulon, its ruler. And so they have to do that. And by the way, this doesn't work real well to do on your own. You really want someone praying with you to do it because deliverance is not something we generally do on ourselves. Uh, if you want to pray this prayer, it may just, if we say, soften up the beach a bit, but, but you really do want to have somebody praying with you to do this. So, all right, now that we've confessed the, <clears throat> or declared that we will not serve Jabulon or the Lodge, I renounce the blessings, the curses, the vows, and the covenants of the Freemasons, all four of those. Now, each has its own uh, vector, and the order I don't think is as important as that you cover them all. So the Freemasons purport to give you blessings, one of the most common of which is financial blessing coupled with political influence. These are the two big things that most Freemasons join for. So we've got the blessings, we've got the curses. What are the curses? Well, things like death and infirmity um, or losing your business. If you ever walk away from the Freemasons, we'll take away from you what we gave you. So um, I'm taking it way out of context, but the idea is the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Well, the, the Masons give and the Masons take away. So we've got the, the, um, the blessings, the curses, the vows and the covenants. So these ancestors, or if it was the individual then they themselves um, they made certain vows about what would happen to them if they ever broke 
the Freemason line and walked away from it. And they took covenants with the Freemasons. They came into a, an eternal agreement through their own rituals and whatnot. Um, so they renounce all four of these um, vows, curses, uh, blessings, curses, vows, and covenants. So that's that. All right. Now um, that they've done all that, uh, we forgive them and we forgive. This is what the prayer minister is doing, not the individual. Uh, we, I forgive you in your generations for these sins of turning against the Lord and of worshiping demons. And now in the name of Jesus, I break the power of the Masonic vows, curses, covenants, and blessings. And in the name of Jesus, I command Jabulon to come out. And sometimes he'll come right out and it'll be, you know, quite a show. Other times you'll be there for a couple of minutes, you know, Jabulon, come out, Jabulon, come out, Jabulon, come out. I remember having to do this one night as we were closing a service in a completely different part of Australia. Uh, two women approached me at the very, very end and said, we have Freemasonry in our family and we want to get delivered. And I mean, for like maybe three or four minutes, I'm standing there going, Jabulon, come out, Jabulon, leave, get out in Jesus name. And there's a little bit of shaking in their body, but there's not any like explosive release. And the pastor is tapping his foot because he's one, he's from one of these, I didn't quite realize it, but anyway, I learned there. He was from one of these branches of the church where they say, nah, Christians can't be bothered by demons and all that Freemasonry stuff. That's just a bunch of hooey. So he's sitting there tapping his foot, eyes rolled up, looking at the ceiling like, just get it over with Ken. Come on, we know this is all nonsense. And all of a sudden, at couple minutes into it again I don't remember if it was two or three minutes four minutes but all of a sudden both of these women just explode in a paroxysm of coughing and sneezing and vomiting and they they got delivered and as we say they got delivered hard and so then we had to clean up the vomit on the floor and so forth well now the pastor was even more unhappy both because he was wrong but because we had barf to clean up but they got delivered and they came back to another meeting in another town later on and thanked me and said that their fortunes had turned, their health had gotten better, um, their marriages had gotten better. I mean, everything had changed because the curses of the Freemasons were no longer on them. So yeah. that's, in a nutshell, how you do it. But I ran through that in whatever it was, three or four minutes. Yeah. Um, they, people who want to know more should get that recording off my website. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Cool. Well, we need to, We probably need to wrap this up. Ken, thank you again for coming on, uh, resident expert in deliverance space. We like having you on, chatting through all the uh, the weird and spooky. So thanks for jumping on the program. And this is one of the things we want to do is we want to make deliverance ministry not weird and spooky. We just want to bring it back down to, man, as much as we can, the biblical levels. What we're talking about, so much of the Christian faith comes back to the same thing, right? Which is repentance. Um, and faith in Jesus, right? Over and over again. So, you know, if you walk through what Ken just explained, you know, hey, there's a bunch of people who did a lot of things not in faithful service to Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're going to repent of those things. We're going to denounce any power that those things gave us, and we're going to have faith in Jesus. And and really, the Christian message is simple, whether you want to talk about it in deliverance or evangelism or prophecy, like all of them really come back down to this, this worldview of repent and believe, right? Trust God. That's really the focus of the Christian message. So as much as you can hear these things kind of, okay, this sounds odd to me. This sounds odd to me. Just make sure that what you're anchored in is turn from sin, believe in God. Uh, that's really the core of everything that we're talking about today. And, and if you're uh, man, new to Remnant Radio, and you want to come up with, you know, you want to be follow up with different content just like this. We've had Ken on uh, in the past. We've had other uh, pastors, teachers, scholars, theologians, practitioners uh, from different tribes, different churches, different denominations talk about deliverance ministry, talk about healing, prophecy, these kinds of things. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and subscribe to the newsletter. That's the best way to stay in contact with us. I uh, make sure that you're getting notified when we come out with content just like this. Ken, thank you again uh, for coming on to the program. It's always fun having you, man. Uh, really enjoy it, and uh, we'll see the rest of you guys next time from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time on Monday and Wednesday. Ken, one last time, tell people how they can find your ministry if they want to get connected. Uh, www.orbisministries.org. Ministries doesn't need any explanation, and Orbis is O-R-B-I-S. It's a Latin word, and um, it means the world, so we are sent into the world. Orbisministries.org, not .com. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ken, once again. And we'll see the rest of you guys on Wednesday. We're going to be reviewing some prophetic words for 2024. Should be quite exciting. See you then.